What's up, Ninja Nerds? In this video today, we're gonna to be talking about malabsorption. This is part of our clinical medicine section. If you guys like this video, it makes sense, it helps you to really smash your exams, please support us. And some of the ways that you can do that is by hitting that like button, commenting on the comment section, and subscribing. Also, do yourself a favor, and I really mean this. You'll gain a lot of understanding from these topics. If you go down the description box below, click on the link that goes to our website. There you'll find great notes that I think will augment your learning, illustrations that'll help you to go quickly and recap on the topic, and maybe follow along. On top of that, quiz questions that'll test your knowledge, and much more. So go check that out on the website and become a member. All right, let's talk a little bit about malabsorption. So we're talking about malabsorption. There's actually two different types of processes. So malabsorption in itself is a very specific pathophysiological process, but it can be very, very similar to another pathophysiological process, and that's called maldigestion. So I want us to have just a basic understanding of the pathophysiological differences between the two. Then once we do that, we'll talk about what are the particular causes of malabsorption and what are the particular causes of maldigestion, okay? So let's focus on the first one and that's malabsorption. So what I'm doing here is I'm taking a piece of the small intestine. So this could be duodenum, jejunum, ileum, and I'm zooming in on it. What I want you guys to understand is what's happening in malabsorption. The primary process here is here we have the mucosa. So these are the enterocytes. These are responsible for helping to aid in digestion, but also allow for absorption. Do you see what's interesting about this one in comparison to this one? The mucosa is damaged. So that's one really big difference between these two is you have what's called mucosal injury. And if you have mucosal injury, you're gonna have mucosal dysfunction. And so you have to think about what's the big concept here. If the mucosa is injured, the enterocytes are injured, am I gonna be able to take things like nutrients? Let's say for example, here I have some type of nutrient of some sort. It's a macronutrient, maybe this is a fat, maybe this is a carbohydrate, maybe this is a protein. And here I have enzymes, but these enzymes, they're working normally. So enzyme function is gonna be intact, all right? So this is actually gonna be normal. So we'll put that this is actually okay. There, this is normal function here for the enzymes. There's no injury here. There's no problematic issue between these two. So with that being said, I take this big molecule here and I'll have it kind of metabolized or digested, if you will, by these enzymes. And so they'll take these big, big molecules here and they'll break them up properly into their smaller little kind of like building blocks like monosaccharides or fatty acids or amino acids. So this process will occur properly. They'll have the enzymes metabolizing these and digesting them into smaller little building blocks, which will help it easier to be allowing for absorption. But if the mucosa is injured, if you don't have proper enterocytes, are you going to be able to absorb these nutrients? No. And so the problem that occurs here is that these nutrients are not going to be getting absorbed. And so what ends up happening is, is you lose tons of things. You increase your fat loss, you increase your carbohydrate loss, you increase your protein loss, you increase micronutrient loss. So you're gonna lose a lot of different things. Fat loss, protein loss, carb loss, and micronutrients. And there's a bunch of different types of things for this one as well that we'll go into in the complications section. But I think this is the big concept is that there's not going to be proper absorption. So with this being said, if you have decreasing absorption, what's the primary mechanism behind the decreasing absorption of these nutrients? It is going to be mucosal injury. But the enzymes that are aiding in the digestive process are completely fine, those aren't the problem. Before we go down and talk about the, the actual causes of this malabsorptive process, let's talk about the differences now comparing these two between malabsorption and maldigestion. Same thing, I have a piece of the small intestine, duodenum, jejunum, ileum, whichever one, I'm zooming in on it, all right? Have these big molecules, again, this could be a couple different things. This could be fat, this could be large proteins, this could be carbohydrates, whatever it is, they're supposed to interact with these enzymes. But what if these enzymes don't allow for this interaction? 
So now these enzymes, for some particular reason, maybe it's an enzyme or something else that helps aiding in the digestive process. If that's not occurring, if we're not allowing for this to occur, we're inhibiting the proper digestion of these macronutrients. So now you won't be forming some of these smaller molecules. So you're gonna get these big, big, big molecules. Can you absorb these things across these mucosal cells? No. So the problem with this is not necessarily a mucosal injury. The mucosa is intact, right? So here we have a mucosa that is intact. It's normal, if you will. We can even use that terminology that, or that kind of error that we showed over there, that it's normal. There's no problem with that. The problem though that exists is there is some type of enzyme dysfunction or deficiency. And that is the problem. This is the issue here, that there's decreasing number of these enzymes or there's dysfunction of these enzymes, whatever it may be, you're not allowing for good digestion. If I have decreased digestion of these big molecules, the issue is, is that I can't absorb these big suckers. That's the problem. So this process won't occur. It has nothing to do with the mucosal cells. It's because I can't kind of digest these big monsters here. And that's the big process here. So decreasing digestion will still lead to, what do we say here? It'll still lead to decreased absorption. It's just a slightly different mechanism. That's what I want you guys to understand. So they're kind of similar in their concept but they're different true pathophysiological mechanisms, okay? Now, if I'm not absorbing these particular things, a lot of this stuff, same concept, I'm gonna lose lots of fats, I'm gonna lose lots of proteins, potentially, I'm gonna lose carbs, potentially, and another thing I could lose is micronutrients, or, you know, so I may lose a lot of micronutrients. Now, we'll talk about this, because it's very interesting. In this process, it's slightly selective. So not all of these things are being lost, right? So it's not always gonna be fat loss, protein loss, carbohydrate loss, micronutrient loss. It depends upon the enzyme that's dysfunctional. What if the enzyme only helps in breaking down carbohydrates? Well, then you're only gonna lose carbs. What if you have a bunch of enzymes that metabolizes everything? Well, then you will lose all of these micronutrients and macronutrients. And so that's a really important thing to be able to remember. Sometimes it could be partial malabsorption, which is, it could be in the scenario of where you're only missing a very specific enzyme that digests carbs, or global malabsorption, which could be in the scenario that <clears throat> I'm not digesting all of my macronutrients. And we'll talk about the comparisons there in a second. Now that we have a comparison to differentiate these two, what I wanna do now is I wanna talk about what are the causes of malabsorptive physiology due to mucosal injury. Then we'll talk about what are the causes of maldigestion pathophysiology due to enzyme or digestive dysfunction. All right, my friends, so one of the causes of malabsorption which causes mucosal injury is celiac disease. Celiac disease is really interesting. It's also kind of, a, kind of like an entero, uh, sensitive, like it's a, it's a gluten sensitive enteropathy. And so there's a specific molecule, it's called a gluten. So we see this in wheat, rye, grain, barley, anything that contains that kind of substance. And what happens is within the gluten, there's a special type of like small protein here called gliadin. And gliadin, for some reason, is like super immunogenic in certain people. And so what happens is, is this gliadin molecule can cross the mucosa. And when it crosses the mucosa, it comes into contact with some reason for certain types of antigen presenting cells, find it like super immunogenic. And they'll phagocytose it and express it on an MHC2 molecule. So here they'll express a piece of that protein on this MHC2, which is in this red color. It'll then go and take that to a T helper cell as a T cell receptor, which will click on it and bind it. This T helper cell, once activated, will then release a bunch of different types of cytokines, so many different types, they're not super pertinent here. But these cytokines will then go and stimulate this plasma cell. And this plasma cell is really where everything starts to kind of go wrong. The plasma cell will start secreting a bunch of different types of antibodies. And these antibodies, unfortunately, were geared towards this gliadin. 
but they'll unfortunately go and create a very significant immunogenic reaction that'll cause mucosal damage. And so whenever these are produced, they're produced against the gliadin, which is in the gut, unfortunately, but that'll also lead to just inadvertent injury to the mucosa. And so you end up with all this like massive mucosal injury and inflammation. The question is, is what are these specific antibodies? Because they're helpful diagnostically. A lot of them are IgA antibodies because you produce IgA antibodies in usually mucosal surfaces, respiratory tract, genital urinary tract, and GI. And so there's what's called the tissue transglutaminase antibody, which is an IgA subtype. You also have the deaminated gliadin peptide, which is an IgA subtype, and the endomyceal antibody IgA subtype. These are going to be the really important types of antibodies that are produced that'll go and cause mucosal injury. And if you cause mucosal injury, what do you think is the overall result? Especially if this affects your small intestine, you're gonna to lead to decreased absorption of particular nutrients. And so that's the concept that actually develops within this. And I think this is the really, really important point to take away. And again, usually it's gluten is the trigger. With Whipple's and Tropical Sprue, these are much less common malabsorptive kind of causes. Whipple's is actually due to a really weird type of bacterial pathogen. So let's say here, I have this weird pathogen, okay? And this weird pathogen likes to cause potential injury, okay? And usually, uh, the particular pathogen that we see with this one is called T. whippoli, all right? And it's Tropherma whippoli. Now, this particular pathogen, what it does is, is it actually kind of causes direct injury, it causes direct injury to these patients' mucosa. So when it injures their mucosa, it'll lead to decreased absorptive capacity. The reason why patients experience lots of this Tropherma whippoli is not really understood. We don't really have a reason as to why this guy is the particular problem. But what we know is, is that this potentially happens and this nasty bacteria can cause mucosal injury. The other one that we may have a little bit more of an understanding of, just because it's a little bit more understanding and kind of we have an epidemiological factor to it, is there's other particular situations where people who live in the tropics or go and kind of experience lots of the tropical life, they have much, much higher loads or bacterial overgrowth of nasty pathogens called E. coli or Klebsiella. And these are naturally kind of part of our GI flora. But if you overgrow these really, really nasty bugs, they can cause mucosal injury, all right? The question is, is why is there this bacterial overgrowth? The concept behind this one tends to be that people who live in the tropics, for some reason, increase experiences of bacterial overgrowth, which causes mucosal injury. Whereas Tropherma whippoli, which causes Whipple's disease, is not usually a patient who's living in the tropics. So I think the big thing to ask, ask the patient is, do they have any sensitivity that they know of to gluten? Have they been living in the tropics or have they visited the tropics recently? Because then you can kind of narrow a lot of things down. You can say, it's probably celiac if it's gluten sensitivity. It could be potentially tropical sprue if they've been living in the tropics or experienced a lot of time in the tropics. And if it's not those, then I can start to say, it could be Whipple's disease. Now, with that being said, the overall concept is that these patients experience lots of mucosal injury. And we'll talk about some of the other unfortunate complications that these guys experience. We'll go into more detail of that a little bit later. All right, so we have an understanding of the causes of malabsorption. What about the causes to maldigestion? This one's relatively interesting. You know patients who can have what's called pancreatic insufficiency? Usually there's some type of damage to the pancreas. And this is usually like fibrosis or calcification, something that kind of like really leads to a decreased capacity of the pancreas. Now you have to know that the pancreas makes a bunch of different enzymes. It makes proteases, Right? So what's one enzyme that it may make? It may make these enzymes called proteases. And what do you think proteases do? They break down proteins. 
It may make amylases, which break down carbohydrates. It may make lipases, which break down lipids. But if you have a disease where you're producing little amounts of amylases, little amounts of proteases, and little amounts of lipases, are you going to be able to properly metabolize these big, big molecules, these big macronutrients? No. And so this process becomes impaired. And you won't be able to allow for these to be properly digested and you can't absorb these big, big molecules. That's why they develop a decrease in this absorption because of maldigestion. But what's causing the pancreas not to produce these enzymes? The primary causes are usually chronic pancreatitis. And so if a patient has chronic pancreatitis, look for a chronic alcohol use. That could be one really, really big common cause. Another one could be in a patient who's a little bit younger and has a history of pulmonary, frequent pulmonary infections. Maybe when they were little, they had what's called meconium aspiration. And you definitely want to think, oh, now they're having problems with malabsorption. Think about cystic fibrosis. So these are two potential causes that can lead to pancreatic dysfunction and lead to chronic, chronic fibrosis, damage of the pancreas, and then decreased enzymatic production. This patient will experience global malabsorption. These patients will all experience global malabsorption. These other two though, do not experience global malabsorption, meaning that they don't lose proteins, fats, carbohydrates, and micronutrients, all of them. They only lose some of those nutrients. I'll explain which ones they are. But remember, global, global, global malabsorption. This next one's called bile acid deficiency. It's pretty simple. You're not making, or at least in some way, shape, or form, getting bile acids into where? Into the small intestine. Bile is really important because what it does, it takes, it, it doesn't really help in what we call digestion per se. But let's say here we have these big fat globules. All right, so this is big fat globules, these guys. What bile salts are supposed to do, or bile acids are supposed to do, which is these little guys right here that I'm drawing in green, is these bile acids are supposed to bind with the fat globules and help to emulsify it. So take big fat globules and turn them into small little fatty droplets. And so if it does this process, let's say here, it's gonna take these fat globules and they're going to interact with these bile acids. What the bile acid should do is, is they'll bind with the fat globules, which I'll draw here in the mouth of these guys. Here's these big fat globules. It should break it down into small little fatty droplets. You wanna know why? Because now lipases, which are produced by the pancreas, should be able to go in there and rip those fats up into fatty acids and aid in the absorption. So it's not really an enzyme problem per se, it's a emulsification problem. So in these patients, they don't allow for this process to occur. There's no issue with, there's no problem with being able to take the flat fat globules and turn them into small fatty droplets. So there's decreased fat droplets. And then because of that, you're not gonna be able to go and digest these by lipases. Then you won't absorb them. So eventually downstream, you're not gonna be able to absorb these bad boys. The question that arises, what's causing the bile acids not to be pushed into the small intestine? Well, one is it could be any kind of liver or biliary dysfunction. So some of the things to think about is, could it be cirrhosis? Cirrhosis is whenever you have liver disease, right? Particularly irreversible. And what happens is this could be leading to decreased production of bile. Cause you know, the liver makes bile. And so if your liver is dysfunctional, are you gonna be able to make bile? No. And so this process is impaired. So think about cirrhosis. The other thing is what if I have a stone stuck right here in the common bile duct? Wouldn't that be a potential cause? Yeah. So any type of biliary obstruction because now I can't get the bile out. So I want you to think about cirrhosis. I want you to think about biliary obstruction. And the last one I think that would be important is Bile acids are supposed to actually be, after they're done with their function, they're supposed to be absorbed via the ileum and then they eventually go back to the liver, right? So they'll be recycled. And what they'll do is they'll eventually come back here to the liver. What if the ileum is diseased 
or resected or have a disease that causes massive inflammation of that area and destroys it, well then am I gonna be able to use this enteropathic circulation to absorb them and bring them back? No, and I'll lose them in my poop and I'll never can be able to continue to regenerate them as fast. What's a disease that causes ileal inflammation primarily? Crohn's disease. And so in patients who have some type of ileal disease, and I think the best example of this is in the scenario of Crohn's disease, these patients won't be able to absorb the actual bile acids because they have an ileal disease that affects their, their absorptive process. So that's a really, really big one as well. The big thing to remember though with bile acid deficiency is they're only losing fats in their stool. They're not absorbing fat. So this is an example of what's called a partial malabsorption. I'm gonna write that down next to it. This is an example of a partial, partial malabsorption. All the other ones are global. The last one that I wanna tell you about is lactose intolerance. It's another type of partial. And this one, it was only fats, only fats and then associated things from the fats, like fat soluble vitamins. In lactose intolerance, it's also partial, but the only thing that you are losing, that you have losing here, is carbohydrates. So let's say here I have the small intestine, and here's a big carbohydrate. And it's particularly carbohydrates get broken down into eventually to what's called lactose. And so lactose is present within a lot of milk kinds of containing products. Well, we have an enzyme here, it's called lactase. So here's this one little enzyme here, it's called lactase. What happens is, is patients have dysfunction or decreasing numbers of these lactase. And what happens is if you can't have this process, what's supposed to occur here is lactase is supposed to take lactose and break it down into smaller little sugars so that they can easily be absorbed. But if this process doesn't occur, you aren't able to absorb the actual smaller sugar molecules because this process is inhibited. So what ends up happening is, is these patients lose tons of carbohydrates in their stool. All right, so they end up with tons and tons of carbohydrates in their stool. So this is why this is primarily only an example of partial malabsorption. The question is, why is there a decrease or dysfunction in the lactase enzyme? Why? We don't really have a great answer. What's potentially suspected as the cause of this decreasing lactase is it could be genetic. That could be one particular cause, but oftentimes what we think is that it's acquired. So it's usually after a patient has like a, a bout of gastroenteritis. I think this is relatively common. If they have a really, really terrible bout of gastroenteritis, what happens is you destroy a lot of these small intestine, you inflame it, and you destroy some of those lactase enzymes. And then what happens is you might not be able to completely regenerate enough of those lactase enzymes. So I think it's really important that lactase, uh, lactose uh, intolerance is due to lactase deficiency, which could be genetic, not too common though, or it could be acquired, and I think one of the most common causes of the acquired states of decreasing lactase is injury to the small intestine from a really terrible bout of gastroenteritis. All right, so with that being said, we've talked about malabsorption, and we talked more specifically about the differences in the pathophysiology between the true definition of malabsorption and maldigestion. Understanding really the difference between which one is the mucosa that's actually injured, which one's the mucosa is intact, which one's the luminal enzymes are actually the, not the problem, which one the luminal enzymes or digestive products are the problem. We talked about the causes of malabsorption, which is all global, you're losing proteins, carbs, fats, and micronutrients. And then we talked about the maldigestive causes with pancreatic insufficiency being the only global malabsorptive cause, and then bile acid deficiency and lactose intolerance being the only examples of partial malabsorption, where you're losing only fat and only carbohydrates. Now let's talk about the way these patients present and the complications that arise. All right, my friends, so when a patient has malabsorption, right, whether the malabsorption is truly due to a mucosal injury, right, which we really would consider malabsorption uh, in the scenario of celiacs or tropical spiral whipples, 
or if it's maldigestion due to decreased luminal enzymes or bile acids and you aren't able to digest particular things so that you can absorb them. But either way, you're not absorbing things. It's just the difference in pathophysiology. When these patients present because of not absorbing proper nutrients, they can present with various complications and you have to be able to pick these up. It's usually related to each particular type of nutrients that it's not absorbed. So I think the big thing to remember is, <clears throat> what if the patient doesn't absorb proteins? So that's a one big one, right? So a decrease in protein absorption. So protein is important for that thickness, right? You wanna get that mass. And if you don't absorb proteins, one of the big particular problems here that can start to arise is that the muscles really need those proteins and amino acids to be able to build up large proteins in the muscles. And so without that protein, you're going to start leading to one particular problem, which is muscle wasting. And so the muscles will definitely start to have increased muscle wasting. So they'll start to atrophy, and you'll start to experience some weakness. But the other thing is that the muscles carry a lot of weight on our overall kind of frame. And so one of the big things that can start to happen is that these patients will start to experience a pretty great degree of weight loss. And so whenever you see these patients, watch out for significant weight loss in the scenario of increased muscle wasting. The next thing that I want you guys to think about is that not only is there a problem with not absorbing proteins, which we would only see in global malabsorption, there's also a decrease in the absorption of carbohydrates. Now, when we talk about carbohydrates that are lost, and they're not being absorbed, um, actually in this case, decreased carbohydrate absorption, we should really just say, you're losing a lot of them, but you're not absorbing enough of them. So whenever we have decreased carbohydrate absorption, one of the big concepts to understand here is that carbohydrates, when they're not absorbed, they stay within the bowel, right? So let's say that I keep these carbohydrates here sitting in the bowel. One of the big things that carbohydrates do is they're osmotically active. And what they'll do is they'll yank a lot of water into the bowel, all right? They're super osmotically active. And so now I'm gonna represent this as this blue color that we already have here. It's gonna yank a ton of water into the bowel. As I pull lots of water into the bowel, two things potentially happen. One is I'm gonna end up with a lot of water that I'm not gonna have the ability to absorb. And that's gonna lead to diarrhea. So you're going to lead to diarrhea, and this diarrhea is why? It's because of decreased amount of absorption. But the primary problem here is that you're having a lot of water pulled into the lumen due to what? The carbohydrates being the particular problem here. So again, lots of water is being pulled into the lumen. As lots of lots of water is being pulled into the lumen, you're then going to stimulate a very nasty watery diarrhea. The other thing is, is that whenever you have lots of water, it distends the bowel. So then you're also gonna get a lot of distension. You're gonna distend the bowel from all that water. That distension is then going to precipitate abdominal pain. So these patients will also have a lot of abdominal pain because they get a lot of this distension. So watch out for abdominal pain and distension. But the last one is that carbohydrates are really a source of being destroyed by bacteria. We naturally have some bacteria that are present within this actual gut. And let's say that these bacteria take and break down these carbohydrates. When they break down these carbohydrates, they'll pr produce a lot of gas. And so if there's an increase in gas production, that's gonna also cause more distension and worsen the abdominal pain. But you know what else this is gonna do? It's gonna cause you to little toots toots. So you're gonna end up with a lot of flatulence. And so that's another potential complication here is lots of flatulence. So I think that's one really, really big thing to watch out for is does a patient have increasing diarrhea? Do they have increasing abdominal pain and increasing flatulence? This is all because of decreased carbohydrate absorption, pulling water into the bowel, causing increasing distension, lots of bacteria break down the actual carbohydrates, produce lots of gas and increase flatulence. So again, just to remember here, what are these like little maroon things here? These are bacteria in the bowel. And these can also help in aiding this process. So 
carbohydrate absorption not occurring, protein absorption not occurring, what else could be a problem? Well, the next one's fat. So fat not being absorbed is another really big problem. And so whenever there's decreased fat absorption, what do we see here? Well, one of the big things is that if you don't absorb fat, a lot of the fat ends up in the stool. And if you have lots of fat in the stool, so a lot of what we call fecal fat, Fecal fat is uh, pretty nasty in the sense that it causes your stools to become super greasy and foul smelling. And whenever you have these patients come in, they'll often tell you that they're having these really greasy and very foul smelling stools. And this is often classic of what we refer to as steatorrhea. So I want you to watch out for a patient who comes in with increasing weight loss, muscle wasting, diarrhea, maybe some intermittent abdominal pain with lots of flatulence, and f greasy, foul-smelling stools. These are all suggestive of potentially global malabsorption. The other problem that makes it even worse is that whenever you don't absorb fat, so decreased fat absorption, right? So we haven't absorbed proteins, carbohydrates, fats. Another scenario is we have decreased fat absorption, same thing. Here's the difference though. You know what else gets absorbed with fat? Vitamins. Do you know which types of vitamins get absorbed with fat? Fat soluble vitamins. And so what happens is these patients get deficiencies in a bunch of different vitamins. What are those vitamins? So you'll end up with a decreased absorption of vitamin A. And if you don't absorb vitamin A, this will lead to some particular presentations. You'll have decreased absorption of vitamin D. You'll have decreased absorption of vitamin E, and you'll have a decreased absorption of vitamin K. And so this is one of the really, really profound complications that you have to be watching out for, which makes things a little bit more complicated, sadly. But if you have decreased vitamin A, this really affects the eye. And oftentimes the most common presentation is this really affects some of the uh, particular structures in the, the actual retina that control our ability to see things during the night. And so what happens is this leads to night blindness. So if a patient says that they're having really, really difficulty in being able to see things at night, definitely think about a vitamin A deficiency. The other one is vitamin D deficiency. So in a vitamin D deficiency, this is important in being able to control calcium. So when patients who have low vitamin D, they oftentimes have low calcium. And that low calcium, because they're not absorbing the calcium, will then drive the bones, that'll stimulate the bones to say, oh, calcium's low. If the calcium is low, I need to rip calcium from the bone. And so as you start kind of chewing and chewing and chewing calcium from the bone, the bones start getting weaker. And this can cause rickets in a younger patient or osteomalacia in an older patient, right, or an adult age. The other thing is that vitamin E can also be deficient. This controls normal nerve function and red blood cell activity. And so whenever there's less amounts of this, the nerves don't kind of send signals properly, and the red blood cells lice and pop open. And we don't really know the exact mechanism of this concept, but we do see that these patients are developing increased uh, uh, incidences of neuropathy and increased incidences of hemolytic anemia. I think the biggest one that you'll probably be related to or tested to on the exam is gonna be related to this one. Vitamin K is really important and utilized by the liver. There's an enzyme called uh, vitamin K epoxide reductase. And so there's this kind of circular reaction. We'll talk about this more in pharmacology, but this helps in being able to aid in the synthesis of procoagulants. These procoagulants are going to be a bunch of different factors. Factors two, factors seven, factors nine, factors 10, and there's even protein C, S, antithrombin three. There's a bunch of these suckers. What ends up happening though, is if you have decreased vitamin K, this enzyme is dysfunctional. You don't synthesize all of these proteins, these more particularly. These are procoagulants. And if you don't have enough procoagulants, you can't stop 
you won't be able to induce a clot you should per se so procoagulants you want to stimulate a clot if you don't have them they can't stimulate a clot so you'll bleed and oftentimes the most common presentation for these patients is bleeding and this could be in the form of GI bleeding this could be in the form of mucocutaneous bleeding so it's a really important to look for that okay so fat malabsorption can lead to a lot of scary complications. We can see this one in global malabsorption, but we can also see it in the partial type due to bile acid deficiency because that affects fats. The last thing and probably a really interesting one is that the small intestine is really important for micronutrient absorption. So this includes things like B12, uh, folate, as well as iron. And if you don't absorb these, these are super, super important. Whoopsie. And being able to tell the bone marrow, they kind of help to signal and help with the development to tell the bone marrow, hey, produce red blood cells. If we have less of these, the bone marrow will no longer have the micronutrients it needs to be able to synthesize red blood cells. And so these patients will have decreasing number of red blood cells. What do we call that? Anemia. And so oftentimes you can see how malabsorption can cause a plethora of complications. It can be relatively difficult to identify. I think the easiest way to remember it is what will be the protein absorbed of def uh, kind of defects, the carbohydrate, the fat, and the micronutrient. Think about that in a patient who's definitely potentially presenting with a malabsorptive syndrome. To finish this off, I think it can be a lot. I know it's kind of complicated to go through a lot of this and you're like, dang, I feel like I'm still kind of struggling a little bit. It's okay. I think one of the big things to remember here is a lot of these patients will present in one of two camps. And I just want you to be able to remember these. Global malabsorption is it's all of them. Okay? So I'll represent them color coordinated. You're not absorbing fats. You're not absorbing proteins. You're not absorbing, what do we use this as, black carbohydrates. And you're not absorbing micronutrients. All of these things are not occurring, okay? So if I were to represent this in that color coordinated fashion, all of these are not being absorbed, okay? So this is what we call global malabsorption. So these patients will experience everything above. Which diseases cause global malabsorption? Anything that damages the mucosa and anything that leads to all the enzymes that <laughs> metabolize these things being deficient. So I would see this in celiac. I would see this in tropical sprue. I would see this in Whipples. And I would see this in, well, we, I'm going to abbreviate it. We also call this exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. So EPI, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. All of these are mucosal injury. This is the one where you don't produce any of the enzymes to digest all of these things, okay? Partial malabsorption is it's only a few of these. So for example, in bile acid deficiency, what are you not absorbing? Fats, because you can't emulsify them and then aid them to be kind of broken down by lipases. And so you don't absorb fats very well. In lactose intolerance, what do you not kind of metabolize or digest? Carbohydrates, particularly lactose. And so you can't absorb carbohydrates. But there's no problem with protein. There's no problem with micronutrients of any sort. And so that's the big difference. This one pertains to bile acid deficiency. And so it'll only present with features of fat malabsorption, steatorrhea, and fat soluble vitamin deficiencies. This one, which is lactose intolerance, will primarily present with lots of diarrhea, flatulence, and abdominal pain. That's the big difference between these two. Now, we've kind of gone through here and we've kind of developed a I'd say a pretty good understanding now of a patient having malabsorption versus maldigestion. The differences microscopically between the two is really important here. Why? Well, one of the reasons why is we can actually start off by determining is it maldigestion or malabsorption based off getting what's called a D-xylose test. We have them ingest a tablet that contains D-xylose. Now, D-xylose does not require any metabolism. You know, it doesn't require any digestive enzymes, essentially. You can take it and it can get readily absorbed. 
but the only way it can be readily absorbed is if the mucosa is properly intact to allow for the absorption. So if a patient has an intact mucosa, it'll get easily absorbed across the mucosa. Therefore, the amount of xylose in their serum or the amount that they excrete onto the urine will be pretty good. It'll be elevated or at least in some degree, have an elevated level of desilose more than usual. What that tells me is that the mucosa is intact. The enzymes, again, don't even matter. It doesn't matter if the, you know, I don't have any enzymes or not. If the mucosa is intact, which tells me that it's either excrement pancreatic insufficiency, bile acid deficiency, or lactose intolerance, again, that will come right across the GIT because it's intact. So that's maldigestion. In the other scenario, if the mucosa is damaged, they have loss of the microvilli, villi, brush border enzymes, there's injury, and they can't properly absorb the desilose, it won't get into the bloodstream. Therefore, the serum levels will be low, and therefore the amount in their urine that they excrete will be low. And that would indicate it's a malabsorptive process, something like celiac, something like tropical sprue, whipples, and that's very helpful. So right away, I've already differentiated these based upon the concept of the microscopic level kind of function. Now let's go down the maldigested arm. I know there's excrement pancreatic insufficiency and lactose intolerance, really. So what I want to know is, is there fecal fat? Because I told you right away, lactose intolerance is only going to be partial. That means that there will only be carbohydrate loss. So if the fecal fat's not really there, it's low, not really any fecal fat or very low amounts, it's, it would be lactose intolerance. And if it's really high, it's excrement pancreatic insufficiency. Oh, okay, cool. Well, if I know that the fecal fat's really high, that's likely... Okay, pancreatic insufficiency. There's another enzyme that I can test for, especially in patients with chronic pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis if there's a very declined pancreatic function. There's an enzyme that the pancreas releases into the stool called fecal elastase. And if the pancreas is damaged, it won't release the fecal elastase. So if they have high fecal fat and a low fecal elastase, I have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And that would be super helpful. Another reason why this is helpful if I tested the fecal fat and it's positive, and the fecal elastase was normal, it could be indicative of something called bile acid deficiency. It's important to remember that. If the fecal fat is also positive, it does indicate that there's probably a malabsorptive syndrome that's going on, more specifically celiacs, whipples, tropical sprue, and that helps me along with this process. But if the fecal fat's negative, then I suspect that it's probably lactose intolerance. And I can confirm that by doing a hydrogen breath test. I'll have them consume some type of tablet. Usually, when they, uh, they uh, consume this, they'll produce, like, because they're having a lot of the lactose staying with inside of their GIT, they'll metabolize it and they'll produce a lot of gases. And one of those may be hydrogen. If there's heavy amounts of hydrogen that's being detected in the breath, that probably means that they have lactose intolerance and they're having lots of lactose in their GIT, that the bacteria are metabolizing and producing lots of gases as a result. Now let's go down the malabsorptive limb. So I already know high fecal fat, low fecal elastase, pancreatic insufficiency. High fecal fat, normal fecal elastase, probably biosid deficiency. No fecal fat, high amounts of hydrogen detected in the breath on the hydrogen breath test, lactose intolerance. If I have low serum levels of Z xylose or I just test and they have a high fecal fat, could be malabsorption. I'm malabsorption. I don't know if it's celiacs, tropical sprue, or whipples. What I do know is that in celiac disease, there is some specific antibodies, trans, uh, trans, uh, tissue transglutaminase, deaminated gliadin peptide, and endomycial antibodies. And they have to be present, at least some of them, to diagnose celiac disease. So if I have a tissue transglutaminase, oh baby, it's likely that they have celiacs. But let's say that it came back negative or inconclusive, I could get other ones like the DPG, the DGP, better in kids, but if I get the anti-endomycial antibody and that's positive, I have confirmed that it's likely the patient has celiac disease. Another thing that adds to the support of celiac disease is that oftentimes they have something called dermatitis herpetiformis, which is this like weird skin lesion that's usually indicative of them. So if I were to see a positive tissue transglutaminase, a positive anti-endomycial antibody, or a positive DGP, and dermatitis herpetiformis, I definitely likely have celiac disease here. I could, if I want to, go down the limb and say I could get a biopsy to truly confirm and diagnose the presence of celiac disease. And I would see that there would be a lot of knocking out of the villi, a lot of crypt hyperplasia, and a lot of problems where the microvilli are like knocked down. 
but it's not absolutely necessary, but it would confirm the diagnosis. If these antibodies come back negative, at least all of them, let's say I started off with this one, it was negative, that doesn't mean that it couldn't still be celiacs. But if I get the DGP and the anti-endomysial and those are both negative, it's pretty good idea, pretty confident that it's not celiacs. And then again, do they have any dermatitis or pediformis? If they don't have that, that probably means it's probably Whipple's or tropical sprue. Oftentimes history is gonna be the key thing here. Another thing that could be helpful here is do they have any other neurological issues, cardiac issues, joint issues? The reason why is if they have any cardiac instability, a lot of arthralgias, myalgias, and the neurological like, disorders, this could be indicative of Whipple's. I think the big thing is also tropical sprue, it's within the name. Have they had any recent travel to tropical areas such as the Caribbean, India, Asia? That could also suggest this. Either way, usually the most diagnostic kind of confirmatory test for these would be a biopsy. Now, if you did obtain a biopsy, I think one of the interesting things is that sometimes you may see these periodic shift macrophages, and these are relatively helpful, and they kind of help with adding to the diagnosis here, particularly of patients having something like Whipple's disease. All right, so that covers the diagnosis. Now let's move into the next step here, which is the treatment of malabsorption and maldigestive disorders. So in a patient who we kind of diagnose as pancreatic insufficiency, maybe we determine that based upon the presence of fecal fat, a low fecal elastase, and elevated d xylose on their urine or serum testing. I definitely think that this would also be supportive if they have an underlying history of chronic pancreatitis, maybe evident on imaging. And on top of that, maybe a diagnosed history of cystic fibrosis. If they do, it's important to remember that they're you're not going to be able to kind of fix what they have. The damage has already been done. Oftentimes, you just have to replace, replace the enzymes that they're missing. So you're going to have to give them pancreatic enzyme replacement. So you're going to give them pancreatic lipase, amylase, and proteases so that they can ensure that those things are getting digested and properly absorbed. Lactose intolerance is often about avoiding lactose-containing foods. Um, but if you can't do that, or you don't want to do that, you oftentimes can try to replace the lactase enzyme, oftentimes prior to consuming a meal that's rich in lactose. Again, another option is avoid lactose in general. Celiac disease is oftentimes, again, avoiding the trigger, which is usually gluten. If you avoid gluten, they should have an improvement in their symptoms. They should have less diarrhea, less malabsorption. And again, this is usually going to be the thing that we see as a benefit to these patients. Lastly, Whipple's disease is usually due to an infection, the trifema, trifema whippoli. And so once you diagnose these patients, which is usually based upon the presence of neuro, joint, cardiac involvement, along with negative, seronegative testing on their you know, antibodies, such as the TTG, the DP, DGB, as well as the EMA antibodies that are seen in celiacs, if that's negative, neuro, joint, cardiac involvement, and periodic shift macrophages that are present on their biopsy, it's Whipple's. And you're going to treat these patients with antibiotics. Oftentimes, you start off with ceftriaxone, then you'll extend them for at least a year with Bactrim, which is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. The last one's tropical sprue. Again, this one is usually some type of underlying infection, maybe E. coli, maybe Klebsiella of some sort. Either way, with these patients, they're going to require antibiotics, and oftentimes it's tetracycline. The last thing to remember is for these patients, you can try your best to treat the underlying disease, but they may miss some of the nutrients, the micronutrients, such as B12, folate, and iron. So if the patient is developing anemia due to these problems, it's important, yes, give them the pancreatic enzyme replacement, put them on a gluten-free diet, treat them with antibiotics, but don't let their anemia hang around. Replace those vitamins as needed or the micronutrients as needed. Give them folate and B12 replacement if they have anemia. Give them iron replacement if they have anemia. And again, give them fat-soluble vitamins if they're developing things like night blindness if they're developing things like hypocalcemia, if they're developing complications such as bleeding, replace those in combination with treating their underlying cause. All right, my friends, that covers malabsorption and maldigestion. I really hope it made sense. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. And as always, until next time.